Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. My nest just got emptier as Aww. I sent my oldest off to his first year of college over the weekend. That was rough enough. But at least I didn't have to send him off to space. Later in the show, we'll talk with astronaut Katie Coleman from Shelburne and the family she had to say goodbye to when she blasted off to the International Space Station. We'll hear about the movie that tells their story, The Longest Goodbye, which is screening at Amherst Cinema this Thursday. But first, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, there are about 883,000 Latinos in Massachusetts making up about... 12.8% of the state's population. More than 16% of the state's Latinos live in the four western counties, with Holyoke having the most at 53.4%, followed by Springfield with 47.5%. Back in May, NEPM's Elizabeth Roman published a story with the headline Springfield Organizations to host first New England Latino Festival this summer. It reads, a new festival planned for the end of summer in Springfield, Mass., will bring together many of the existing Latin American cultural groups living and working in western Massachusetts. The New England Latino Festival is scheduled for August 25th and 26th at Riverfront Park. The event will highlight food and music from the Caribbean, South America, Central America, and Mexico. The Hispanic American Library, a nonprofit based at Union Station in Springfield, is partnering with Springfield's Puerto Rican Cultural Center to run the festival. And joining us to tell us more about the festival is the executive director of the Hispanic American Library, Juan Falcón. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. (laughs) I want to know more about the Hispanic American Library. Seriously. So I've I've walked by the Springfield Puerto Rican Cultural Center many times, but I want to hear more about the Hispanic American Library. What is it? The Hispanic American Library. Uh, So what it is is actually um, in a different way of looking at things outside of the box. It's actually a place where books are in the shelf. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so a traditional it, it, library. Traditional library. That's what a library is. And, <laughs> and what I meant to say was that um, what we tried to do is not a lending library, Yeah. as I explained myself. And um, the authors from those books actually meet the community. So we invite the community in to meet the authors. Nice. Uh, be able to interact with the authors. And we have uh, every month we have a different author that comes in. Um, so... Regarding the question itself, sometimes I wonder uh, the scope of the Hispanic American Library because it brings a lot of other uh, things together that um, haven't been done in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and one of them is the uh, author series that we have every month. Uh, We also, um, we've been fortunate to have people uh, that were in a tour from Columbia come in, do a presentation on immigration, Emmy Award uh, gentlemen. Uh, We had folks from... um, UMass come in and and do presentations. So it's really a little bit different than a, what I call growing up, a typical library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just the books. It's these interactive experiences. How long has this library been in existence in Springfield? It's been an assistant at Springfield Union Station for two and a half years. So it's Mm -hmm. pretty new. So that's, but it's great that you are having this uh, ambitious idea to put on this what's anticipated to be a rather large festival, not this weekend, but next. Very, very correct. And the, the history of uh, the Hispanic American Library dates a little bit more than just two and a half years. Right. It dates back to 1999. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of things happen. And of course, when you don't have the, uh, the money to put things together, uh, but I'm very consistent. Uh, I have a particular background that is not necessarily just uh, a learning uh Situation with the Hispanic American Library. Mm-hmm. I also have a correctional background. So uh-huh. I spent 20 years in the military. I spent 20 years working in correction. I'm actually uh, working in mental health, mental health clinician, and I'm licensed uh, in addictions. So the thought of a Hispanic American Library and in partnering with the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, uh, and for those of us that have been uh, around for a bit, we know that the Puerto Rican Cultural Center in its heyday uh, was extremely well recognized. Um, And we're just trying to put pieces together so when we uh, come to the community that we can provide different programs related to the Latin American community. Uh, In itself, it's really um, quite different than anything else that Springfield has experienced. 
We're speaking with Juan Falcone, who is the executive director of the Hispanic American Library based at Union Station in Springfield. Just before we we went on air, we were talking about some of your summer programs that you have. I think that's a big part of it, too, like the things that you're doing with youth, not just to get them interested in in reading things about the culture, but like getting out and, and doing that. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you're doing in that respect, too? Yeah, so our temp, it's... Um I came to the United States when I was seven years old, um, and I've done a lot of the traditional educational components, but the idea about not only uh, having our own library based on Latin American perspectives, also educating the young, uh, our youngest is three years old, <laughs> and educating uh, not only the younger ones, but also the youth related to the culture uh, has been an extremely important part of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, I st- I used to go to traditional libraries and I attended places like UMass and city libraries, but there was a missing link. And that missing link was based on Latin American perspectives, also uh, educating the kids uh, to read Spanish and English. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the literacy program that we do have Saturdays at 12 o'clock in the afternoon until 3 p.m., uh, so they not only learn how to read in Spanish and English, um, we're educating them about Honduras, Argentina, Chile. So they even have a passport at the age of five, which they um, learn what a passport means. They do their own passport. They get stamped when they travel to different locations. Travel intellectually? They don't actually leave the country, right? Travel when when... intellectually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of us can't afford to travel yeah, I know. internationally. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, that's real. <laughs> yes. So we visit, uh, intellectually, we visit other locations in the world and see how people live, what their customs are, uh, and hopefully that can translate into better relationships as you meet people along the way. Is that part of the the beginnings of this festival too, of making it more of a cross diaspora festival, not just Puerto Rican culture, but like all Latin American, Caribbean, Mexican, and Central American uh, diaspora? Yes, um, we want to be able to, and that's why we are uh, recognizing it as the first Latino. Actually, New England Latino Festival, um, we did a, a media tour. So we've been to Worcester, Boston, several parts of Connecticut, just trying to bring people together and provide them the information that uh, we do have this festival. Um, and, and also, the, one of the most important things for me is to be able to sit with other folks um, and look at what we bring to the table. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's a very uh, welcome experience um, when I was 18, I lived in Europe for two and a half years. I'm in the military, so I spent some time in Europe uh, going to different locations. So this idea about not only meeting other people, traveling, uh, getting to know each other, uh, and that's one of the purposes of the festival. You know, let's go to Mexico. Let's see how they live. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's go to Salvador. Let's mm-hmm. see how they do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm looking for I'm actually getting anxious and hungry. <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> Me too, Juan Falcone, executive director of the Hispanic American Library, who's one of the organizing bodies behind the first New England Latino Festival scheduled for a week from this weekend, August 25th and 26th at Riverfront Park in Springfield, a gorgeous location, gorgeous location. to put on a festival. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as we've been alluding to, and as you are wearing, the listener can't see this, but a shirt embroidered with the Puerto Rican flag, there's a lot of celebration of Puerto Rican culture that goes on in Holyoke. There was just the big festival a couple weekends yes. ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's the Springfield Puerto Rican Parade and, and more. Uh, the, this is cross-diaspora. So tell us some of the other aspects, countries that will be represented specifically. Who's coming from where and what? Uh, in, in this festival happening on August 25th and 26th. Thank you again. Um, and just so I don't miss, David Silva is the executive director of the Puerto Rican Culture Center. Uh, and we're in partnership mm-hmm. in bringing this festival uh, opportunity to Springfield. Um, we have a group called Los Nitidos. Los Nitidos are from Boston and they're from Salvador. Uh, so we bring uh, and explore the culture of uh, Salvador. Um, and we also have um, 
Los Laureles eh, del Monte, which is actually uh, Mexican musicians, uh, a lot of them young in age. So just to see the youth, their talent, and uh, their energy. Uh, uh, I didn't learn a few things so I was older. <laughs> but just to see that energy uh, as the youth display in a very positive fashion musically. Um, we have um, a gentleman by the name of Jose Paulo. I'm sorry, Joseph Paulo. Um, Brazilian. Mm -hmm. And his dancers and uh, all those uh, things that would happen in Brazil coming to life with the colors and, the uh, again, the energy. Um, and we also have... Um, the traditional, uh, or not tradition, but one of our uh, musicians, um, Boricua Legends, actually won an Emmy uh, last year for one of their songs, and they're based from New York in Connecticut. They'll be joining us. Um, we have a closing on Saturday, Latin Heartbeats, uh, which is a very popular group. Um, but we also have local, a lot of local talent. Nice. So we have like Ford Lork type of music back from the mountainside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have, um, uh, and I'm trying to think right now, but we have not only from the, from the, uh, from the countryside, but we also have um, from Northampton um, uh, musicians that will be doing some Peruvian, uh, some Cuban. So we just gonna mix it up, right? <laughs> you know, you gonna mix it up. And right you, you have mentioned the food and how it's, you're hungry. We have not talked specifically about that, but mm. what should we expect culinarily from the New England Latino Festival, August twenty fifth, twenty sixth, Riverfront Park in Springfield? Juan Falcone from the Hispanic American <laughs> Library. Yes. Uh, so Monty, what we expect, um, and we actually had a lot of support from the community, and I like to thank the community for their support. Uh, for, you know, for us being able to count on them because without them, nothing is possible. Um, but the music, we have uh, several food trucks, Colombian, Mexican, Dominican, Puerto Rican. We have the Italian ice, can't go wrong. You <laughs> nice. Know? Um, and also, My people aren't quite Latino officially, but we're Latin-based. <laughs> this is, and, and, and I have to agree, Monty, because, you know, looking at Brazil, mm. I, I mean, it, it, it's really similar and, and the controversy at times, like if I go to Puerto Rico, I'm not a Puerto Rican because I grew up in New York City. Mm -hmm. So I'm a New York Rican yeah. uh, in actuality. So we're people that have been fortunate enough to be part of a society. And this is the reason for the New England Latino Festival. Um, no hangups. Let's have a good time. Let's eat uh, different uh, foods that we may be used to. But as people, we're all people. No separation. Is inclusive. I love that. That's mm -hmm. so good. Well, and it teaches you more about like like everybody else's. Like you get to see both the similarities and the differences between the cultures because like there's definitely some threads throughout like the whole continent that you end up encountering no matter where you travel and like even with immigrants coming here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really cool to see and have highlighted too. What other organizations? So you're collaborating with the Puerto Rican Cultural Center. Correct. And are there other organizations that are helping you out with the festival? The um, support, it's really in a different way. Mm. So my collaboration partnership with the Puerto Rican Culture Center is really built around working on a capital campaign. Uh, we did get some money, a line item, uh, to look at the feasibility, but have a building, mm. whereas a cultural center building where we can house various types of programs uh, related to the community and empowering the community. Um, and when we look at things like the equity uh, and diversity and inclusivity, I've been doing that for a very long time before mm. that word became popular. Mm. <laughs> um, so our idea is not only to uh, build and possibly have a cultural center, uh, but our idea is to work with the Bilingual Veterans Association. I was the president at one time of the veterans here in Springfield. Um, I have um, Golden, Golden Ages, which is one of my main supporters. Uh, one of my main sponsors is uh, Cesar Ruiz mm -hmm. uh, from Golden Age. And um, Munson Bank uh, has also uh, stepped up, one of my biggest uh, supporters in regards to the banking industry. Um, and, and I can name several. Stick is part of that. Uh, AIC is part of that. Um, TD is part of that. Um, 
Breezy is part of that. So we did have a lot of support from the community level. And I'm gratefully uh, appreciative. Again, without the support, uh, nothing is possible. So it's something that we put together and support in collaboration with everybody else. So it's very inclusive. Well, I'm excited to see how this comes to be. In, fru- in in reality, at Riverfront Park on mm-hmm. August 25th and 26th, the first ever New England Latino Festival, a huge celebration of music and food from the Caribbean and South and Central America and Mexico and all the islands and <laughs> all of the Hispanic and Latinx community. Juan Falcone from the Hispanic American Library, the executive director, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again. And uh, before I forget... Let me uh, remember my Italian brothers <laughs> who, who, who have been pretty supportive. Uh, they have also uh, sponsored our event, uh, and this is where it's at. Right. We're together as a community. Yeah, we, right. all got, we all got Latin soul, I guess. We all got as, Latin as soul. Mongo Santa Maria said in that song. <laughs> Up next, we'll talk with astronaut Katie Coleman from Shelburne and the family she had to say goodbye to when she blasted off to the International Space Station. And we'll hear about the movie that tells their story, The Longest Goodbye, which is screening at Amherst Cinema this Thursday. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. It was a really cold morning. I remember they're counting down. And then as soon as it lifts off, you can feel it in your chest. My mom is not on the planet. She's really gone. We all start wondering if we're doing the right thing. Should I have been on this mission? Should I have left my family back there? And that can lead to devastating psychological effects. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. The new film, The Longest Goodbye, follows a NASA psychologist tasked with protecting their astronauts who are torn between their dream to reach new frontiers and their need to stay connected to home. The film features Shelburne Mass-based astronaut Dr. Katie Coleman, her husband, acclaimed glass artist Josh Simpson, and their son, Jamie Simpson, who's a Washington, D.C.-based photographer and whose work has been published in People magazine and featured on the Today Show. We are joined by Katie Coleman and Josh and Jamie Simpson, as well as the director of The Longest Goodbye, which is an official selection of the 2023 Sundance Film Festival, Ido Mizrahi. Ido's narrative and documentary films premiered at South by Southwest, Tribeca, and many other festivals and went on to win a number of awards. His films have been distributed by AMC, Sundance, Netflix, Amazon, and MTV. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, Jamie Simpson, who is uh, beaming in from Washington, D.C., it's, uh, you can't actually see your parents unless we uh, turn this laptop around there. Oh, let's see. Yeah. Hello, Jamie. Yeah. Does this remind Hello. you of when Hello, sweetie. You, you were talking on the International Space Station? <laughs> oh, the picture yeah, is much exactly. better. Okay. <laughs> Just ask everyone. <laughs> This is, uh, unfortunately, because I have stuff that I have to read here, Jamie, you have to look at me the whole time. And uh, Ido also joins us uh, via satellite, we could say, I suppose. Uh, But Josh Simpson and Katie Coleman join us in the studio. First, Ido, I mean, it's, it's a story that wants to be told. But what sparked the idea for this as a film? So can you hear me okay? Yes. You sound great. Oh, good. Uh, You know, we visited a number of the NASA hubs early on and we knew we wanted to find a way to kind of tackle interesting challenges associated with long duration space missions. And it was really kind of a chance encounter with a a psychologist by the name of Dr. Al Holland, who's who's featured in the story, who Katie knows quite well and her family as well, um, who started talking about all the attempts, all the efforts they're putting into, you know, helping astronauts stay socially connected when they're when they're in outer space and how important that is to their performance and i thought what a wonderful way to think about connectedness and isolation kind of wrapped in a space allegory a true allegory but a, a true you know sort of space challenge but but how beautifully it sort of sheds light on what we're all going through you know right here on earth so that that's what i found really kind of human and appealing about it and why i wanted to pursue it now, this, I've been a big fan of Katie Coleman forever, <laughs> oh, as well as Josh Simpson, <laughs> because, you know, you can meet a lot of rock stars, meet a lot of amazing glass blowers, but how often do you get to meet an astronaut? And I will say That's that right. the first time we ever met Katie was at a... Uh, Twice this year now. Tw- but was at a, a, a public 
television fundraiser for WGBY many years ago. And I was like, over the moon, pun intended. Um, so, but what I hadn't really thought about is what Ido has brought to light here, the idea that saying goodbye <laughs> when you have to go and do this thing that seems like a dream for so many people, myself included, leave Earth and go to outer space, what you leave behind. So, and I just will say, full disclosure, I had to drop my kid off at, I was going at college this, like, this on is Friday, a, oh, my, my oldest child. Yeah, cried and cried, and cried and cried. You met him, right? <laughs> yes. <gasps> so this is the perfect um, balm for my wounded soul, having said goodbye to my, my own child in a microcosm of what you've had to experience. But for those who aren't necessarily as big a fans of Katie Coleman as I am, tell us about what led you to become an astronaut in the first place. Well, I grew up in a family where exploration was kind of normal. My dad was a deep sea diver living undersea. Um, actually, he didn't live, on, he was a diver, but um, he was in charge of basically building the habitats that men, in this case men, lived undersea, the mm -hmm. sea lab program. And I, so I thought exploration was normal, but it never occurred to me that it could be me because I didn't really see anybody that looked like me or, you know. I could identify with growing up. And it wasn't until I was in college and Dr. Sally Ride came and spoke. At where? At MIT. Okay. Another, I thought it was UMass Amherst. Ma I misremembered the story. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to grad school at UMass and MIT for undergrad. Uh -huh. um, actually, both places of great excellence in my field, chemistry and then polymer science and engineering for, for grad school here. And, uh, and actually, then I met Josh. And we got married. <laughs> Anyways, but that, that was a long it, time later. Yeah, we might want to <laughs> dig into that story, too, because I kind of know the backstory on that, which is, it, is, it was a wrong number. Is that true? It's true. That's true. <laughs> Katie called a wrong number. <laughs> and the rest is history. <laughs> it's Wait, true. I think you, don't you mean like Katie called the right number? She just didn't know it was the right number at the time? Good I don't point. think either of us knew it was the right number. <laughs> How does that, all right, now we're on this tangent. How does that then translate into all of a sudden you're now married years and years and years later? Josh Simpson. Well, Are we going to tell the whole story? No, not the whole one. But really, I just think we, you know, we <laughs> met and, you know, I kind of, it, it was, I, I was like, you know, I mean, well, I'm like, this is the wrong time. <laughs> I still have to go to happy hour and all those things. <laughs> You're not, it's not the right time to meet Mr. Wright, but there he was. We're speaking with Katie Coleman, astronaut, Josh Simpson, glass artist, Jamie Simpson, their son, and Ido Mizrahi, the director from The Longest Goodbye, which will be screened on Thursday at Amherst Cinema that tells the story, not only of your family saying goodbye, but um, chronicling other stories of, of newer astro astronauts who are planning on going to you know, Mars and more. No, no. All right. Um, <laughs> well, I was, I was gonna say that what appealed to me about this is that you know, every one of us, I think, can influence other people, like Sally Ride influenced me. Right. And, and that includes you know, people of all ages, kids. And so, so often we're telling astronaut stories from an astronaut point of view. And I, what I loved were the questions that Ido asked, where mm -hmm. he came and he was asking questions and thinking about what he was going to make this movie about. And he asked questions that were different than any I'd ever been asked in my 24-year career in, in addressing really the human aspect. Because really, we're trying to recruit humans of all ages yeah. to go to space and to be ready to, to do that job of their dreams, whether it's space-related or not. And so to have a movie that touches so many people, and and also each, I often sort of volunteer to tell the family side, a more human side, because I think there's kind of this impression out there that if you're going to have this wild job as a non-traditional player, then you probably don't have time or room or be the kind of person who might have a family too, which I think is wrong. So Because you have, you've all done it. And I mean, the, the movie, um, what I've seen of it, I've seen about half of it. Um, it really, it's heart wrenching to see some of those stories. So Jamie, uh, tell us how old were you when your mom blasted off to outer space? So I was nine years old when she blasted off into space, but at that point, everything that she was doing felt totally normal because for my whole life, she was traveling to Russia or Japan or something like that to train for several months at a time. So then when she finally launched into space, it felt like that it was the culmination of all of this hard work. And it honestly wasn't until she lifted off 
from the launch pad and the power of the rocket is pushing me down into the into the ground that I, I, I just teared up because it, you know, you talk about, okay, I'm, I'm going to space and this is what's happening. And that is all well and good until it actually lifts off. And then you see that, you know, on the top of this ball of fire is someone that you love. It's a, it's a really intense experience. So, yeah. Do you remember it personally, or is it something that you re remember because of film and photography. I often ask my own children, like, how much of this is, does it feel like a real memory and how much of it feels like something that you relive every time you look back at? Because th- there's lots of excellent footage of you very young in, in Ido's movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I'll ever forget all of the feelings that I had that night because it's such a unique experience that I don't think a lot of people get to have. And that especially as a little kid, seeing your mom just fly off of the planet. Like it's not like she's getting on a a plane going to California. She's like not on the planet anymore. (laughs) And so to see that is something that I will never forget. But the film definitely jogs a lot of pleasant memories about what was going on, like in the context of the launch, you know, how cold it was and the like the little fur hat that I was wearing and, and subtle details that really make the story um, really memorable in that way. Well, and something that might not be clear just from watching the film is um, there's a bunch of family videos. When I was up there every Sunday or Saturday sometimes, we would get to have a conference, a video conference. And other than that, we, we could talk on the phone. I had a basically an internet protocol phone. I could call home every day, many times a day if you had time. But on the weekends was the video conferences. And those were taped for us in, pr- in their private. And so basically I have the only copy of those. And from the questions that Ido asked me, I just, I felt like we were on the same mission, which was, I I think when people go to Mars, it's not gonna be the whole planet, it's gonna be a few people, but really when anybody goes, they take all of us with them. Mm. And I think the more that we can help everybody understand that experience and make it their own. And so he was going to, he wanted to do that, or at least that was was how I felt. So I gave Ido, those videos and we agreed that we would together decide you know he would tell me what he wanted to use and I would say whether it was okay and then I realized you know Jamie's more than 18 he'd better decide for himself too. <laughs> actually, actually by the time Jamie or by the time Katie launched J- Jamie had spent basically half his life watching his mom get ready for this flight because mm-hmm. he was six years old when when um, Katie first learned she was assigned to a mission and then she could be anywhere anywhere in the world at that time, whether it was in Canada or Japan or Russia or Germany with different space agencies training for this mission. And Shelburne. And Shelburne. Right. And Shelburne. <laughs> Fabulous 413. But, but, <laughs> but, um, but the, the, actually one, one thing that was an advantage when she was launched was we had an app for our, our iPad. And we could actually see where Katie was circling the Earth at that moment. So we knew – on Sundays when she crossed over New Zealand and started up towards North America that the phone might ring or the or she might we might be contacted with a NASA live video feed for just a few minutes and then we'd talk for four or five minutes, six minutes sometimes. Sometimes it would freeze. It wasn't great. It was ratty calm sometimes or not perfect. But then we could walk out onto the back porch of our house and watch this little star just blaze over our house. It was amazing. It seems like, though, I mean, the whole point of this is, like, connection and how those connections get maintained. But are there any methods that got used for these connections that were, I don't want to say taken for granted when you got back Earthside. That seems so weird to say. But it is real. (laughs) When you got back to Earth, um, that... You realize since the the movie, you may have taken for granted ways that you were really connected while you were in space that once you got back kind of fizzled. Well, I don't know about fizzled. Well, a well, couple things. First of all, you know, the pandemic, I think, made what is connect being connected. What's enough? What's at least something? You know, and, and I think that that's how I felt. I mean, now, and we, you know, our, our email synced like four times a day. It took a day to have a conversation. You know? Yeah. Um, so, that, so it was hard. And I was actually interested to hear Jamie say that, you know, it was neat to see the videos or and that sometimes there was problems with connection when actually when I watched the videos, it was 
horrifically hard, actually, to stay connected. I mean, there would just be these losses of signal and you know, the person, I, I would see them not understanding that we're working really hard to get that connection back. And, and they're just kind of like, okay, what's going on? And somebody keeps them informed, but, and, and me too, you know, so it was actually really just a little plain old, you know, when you're saying, can you hear me? Can you hear me on the phone? And yeah. it's frustrating and it keeps dropping out. When it, you know, it's your only 40 minutes on a Sunday or 30. It was, it, and, and this and was I, when, 2007? Yeah. Um, t- 2000, 2010, 2010, 2010. Yeah. and but, Ido watched them all too, and and I'd be interested in what sort of his overall impression of is this a way to keep people connected and sane? Well, it's also there's a four second delay. Yeah. Mm. So if I say hello, one, two, three, four, hi, <laughs> hi, <laughs> and and so it's it's very strange, and and often Katie would call on an internet phone that they had during the week at some point. We we talked almost every night, but. Um, the phone would ring and there would be no one there. And I knew to wait four seconds at least. Right. And then I'd hear a hello. <laughs> that is glass artist from Shelburne, Josh Simpson, who is the spouse of Dr. Katie Coleman, astronaut, who are both the parents of Jamie Simpson, photographer, who are all featured in a movie that will be screened at Amber Cinema this Thursday called The Longest Goodbye. Coming up more with all of the aforementioned. <laughs> You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. To know whose shirts you wear. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. There's a new film, The Longest Goodbye, which follows a NASA psychologist who is tasked with protecting the psychology of astronauts who have left the planet and who is preparing astronauts to go to Mars and what that's going to mean, even compared to what our guest. Dr. Katie Coleman, who went to the International Space Station, experienced 180 days or so? Total in space, but 159 on the space station, almost six months. And her husband, Josh Simpson, who is the glass artist from Shelburne. I will say one of the most famous glass artists in the world is somebody who did a little glass blowing myself. His name (laughs) preceded him for many years before I actually got to meet him. And we're talking with the filmmaker, Ido Mizrahi. This film is an official Sundance Film Festival selection. It'll be screened at Amherst Cinema on Thursday. Ido, tell us about a little more about this NASA psychologist. Are they still going to be working with the, the, the astronauts that are preparing to go to Mars right now or even to the moon right now? There's another mission that's working on trying to send astronauts to the moon. Absolutely. I mean, I think the what's become, you know, so Dr. Holland, who, who's who been working with NASA for a few decades now and, and kind of started this small unit, you know, he would tell you he had very little elbow room, you know, at the beginning, right? I mean, when they first started, they kind of had an idea at the agency that they should look into the psychological effects of space missions, but they didn't really know what to make of it, right? This is sort of a culture that came out of the Army, came yeah. out of the Air Force. Apollo's right? 1 through 10, all of those guys, who knows what happened to them? Yeah, psychologically, psychologically speaking. How, how much work went into that? But, 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 um, the, not only are they, do they have more room to work now, looking into selecting the sort of astronauts of the future, they're really the, they're letting their input into the selection process, right? So the kind of astronauts that they're looking for now, which really starts with Katie's generation, you know, people who are not obsessed with looking or being perfect, but people who understand that this is going to be really complicated and people whose families accept that these are, there are going to be some issues. And the more open you are about them, you know, the better it's going to be. And so Kayla Barron, uh, uh, an Artemis astronaut who's also featured in the story, um, I wish we had her with us uh, here, too. She would, she, too. she would really she did really interesting stuff. I couldn't talk to two astronauts that's... at the same time. My mind would explode. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Um, so she she and she will be one of the first women on the moon. Uh, if all goes well. And potentially I, I bet my dollar that she'd be one of the first people to go to Mars, too. Uh, it's really not to, and, and you know, really ready. He's someone who was really excited when I started asking similar questions. So what's Katie? She was really excited to talk about these things and and her husband. And and I much has to do with Al and, and his unit and their work of entering those kind of ideas into the selection process. We so added those special point. effects to make it sound more like what it was like when Katie Coleman <laughs> was on the International Space Station trying to talk to uh, Jamie and Josh on Earth. There was a little bit of digital interference there, Ido. Uh, apologies about that. Um, 
Jamie, as I mentioned, you were you were very young when you had to watch your mom blast off. And what really struck me about Ito's movie um, was watching you as a grown up now, but hearing your voice and 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 watching you at that age. We have a tiny clip of of tiny Jamie uh, re- recounting what it's like to uh, say hello and goodbye to your mom in outer space. Hi, mom. It's Jamie. Uh... It does just go to show you how young it, Jamie was. And Jamie, you've talked a little bit about um, what you remember from that. But um, as a mom, Katie having to say goodbye to your son in such a perilous way. I mean, it is not being an astronaut is very dangerous. Um, tell me what you remember from that moment where you had to say goodbye to Jamie at that very young age that we just heard. Um, probably makes me cry just to think about it. But I mean, unfortunately, we had a lot of practice in a way. Yeah. In that, by training, by living in two places, Josh and you know, I lived in Houston and trained in Houston as well as all over the world. So there was a lot of I mean, we th- we thought a lot about Jamie and how this affected him and that. You know, and, and I remember him asking one time, he's like, why do you have to go to stupid old mission control? Uh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and because, uh, you know, we all have jobs in between flights and and that it's just really hard and that, you know, and, and even should I take a job to go be on the space station and be away for so long? Um, so it's it, it. I don't know. You get ready and you. I think all of us compartmentalize to a certain degree. And it's really not until it actually really happens that, you know. There you are. I remember. I mean, I, I remember it was December in Kazakhstan, and it's so cold. And I rem- and we were only allowed to meet outside, and and so I remember just you know those those very cold hugs. You know, be- so we we kind of got a little nod to sneak behind a tree and, and have a hug. <laughs> Actually, yeah, we Katie was sequestered and quarantined for weeks before her flight. Before it was cool in 2020. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Trendsetters. Right. Yeah. I, I hesitate to have you use the word cool. <laughs> right. And and just, I mean, they sequester you because they're worried that kids especially are, are just disease bombs. And, <laughs> and, uh, the head of quarantine's nickname was Dr. No. <laughs> yeah, no matter what, what you asked him, he said no. And, but every, every day I'd go visit Katie, and he would literally wipe me down with alcohol. Wow. And, uh, oh. and, uh, so, I do that to my liver every evening. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but Josh Simpson, you, know, you then have to be the de facto parent on the ground quite literally, while yeah. your wife is either in Kazakhstan, in Russia, or in in space. Tell me about what that was like, having to navigate parenthood kind of alone on Earth with such a young child, while running, a, as I mentioned, one of the most successful glass shops in, in the world, really. Well, it, it, it's funny. I mean, we, we did have a lot of practice doing that, but, but I think Jamie will attest to being traumatized by New Foods Night and... and <laughs> Things like that, where, where he'd be, where he'd be, where no, he'd be it forced. No, it sounds like the best. Yeah, <laughs> where he'd be forced. Like the most fun. He'd be forced to eat something really bizarre, like green beans or, yeah. or spinach I mean, or broccoli. Kalisa, yeah. it was six months. I mean, the first few weeks, yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you're underestimating my desire for new things. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie, do you remember any of those new foods from New Foods Nights besides the ones that he mentioned that oh, are basically? Yes, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of traumatic memories of Brussels sprouts and snow peas and summer squash. I mean, don't take me back to those days, please. <laughs> What's interesting about... Although, although he did live. He, he's <laughs> yeah. still alive. Well, and now he's a food guy. Actually, I mean, he worked at Baked in Shelburne Falls. He, uh-huh. He's a really uh, he's a baker, but also just really loves making food. And we are speaking with the parents uh, of Jamie Simpson. Josh Simpson and Dr. Katie Coleman, the astronaut and glassblower, uh, about the new movie by Ido Mizrahi that'll screen this Thursday at Amherst Cinema, The Longest Goodbye. Uh, we have to take another break, but we'll be back and talk more with Ido and Jamie and Katie and Josh in just a minute. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. And there's nothing left to do. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Khalees Smith. There's a new film, The Longest Goodbye, which follows a NASA psychologist who is tasked with protecting the psychology of astronauts who have left the planet and who is preparing 
astronauts to go to Mars. Josh Simpson, Katie Coleman, Ido Mizrahi, as well as uh, Jamie Simpson, who are all part of this movie, The Longest Goodbye, that'll screen on Thursday. Uh, Ido and Katie and Josh mm-hmm. will all be there. And, and Jamie. Jamie, too? Yes, Jamie. And, just, and Josiah, yeah. our son Josiah, who's oh. older. Yep. So did Josiah have to experience this in the same way, or he was not around? He wasn't he... around for New Foods Night. <laughs> <laughs> He, he was already in college. Right? Yeah. Now, um, Ido, part of the movie yeah. talks about the famous story of the Chilean miners who were mm-hmm. stuck underground for 69 days, 30, uh, 33 Chilean miners. And there are parallels with this to uh, trying to deal with the psychology of what it will mean to send astronauts to Mars for such a long time. Can you talk about why you wanted to include that story in this film? About, about astronauts who have gone to outer space or who are going to go to outer space. And perhaps, like, what differentiates that story from folks who are on submarines for long periods of time? Do you find similarities there, too? Sure. I mean, I think what's so a few things about that story. So just to the listeners who don't know, this was back in 2010. Uh, uh, a couple dozen Chilean miners were stuck underground uh, for a long period of time, what's really different uh, from uh, there's some similarities to submarines. There's some similarities to other uh, analog environments where people get stuck or people are uh, isolated for a long period of time. In Chile, they didn't know if they were ever coming out, and and so what keeps you going on these longer missions, like a submarine mission or a space mission, is that you know it has an end, right? It has an expiration date. You're coming back, and there are people waiting for you who are looking. Uh, to receive you when you come back. And that's that's a big thing that keeps you going, even if it's hard and even if the sort of the last the last quarter aspect, which psychologists will talk about often, the sort of the coming, actually the last moments before coming back being the hardest, you still know you're going back. You know, in Chile, they had no idea if they were going to survive it. And so they sent Dr. NASA, actually sent Dr. Holland, along with a number of engineers, and it's a big team from NASA. But they figured, let's also send uh, Dr. Holland to try as soon as they figured out how to communicate with them underground, and this is before they knew if they were ever going to be able to pull them out, to try to give them some hope. And what he did was, is he actually, because their families basically camped out outside the mines, and it became this like small city in the middle of the Chilean desert of people waiting for their relatives to come out of the ground and not knowing if they ever will. And what Dr. Holland did is he created this sort of synchronized living He figured out how to make sure that when they were eating up uh, above ground, the miners were eating down underground. And when they were sleeping, they were also sleeping to kind of create a kind of sense of normalcy and connectedness. And and inadvertently, he sort of perfected his methods of trying to keep people connected. And where this becomes really relevant is when they start sending people to Mars, they're not going to have real-time communication anymore, right? So when you go away, that you know, when you're that far from Earth, You can't have a video conference anymore. You can't have a a call anymore. So you can only send messages back and forth. You will not have a real-time conversation for three years. So the Chilean... Instead of a four-minute lag, it's a 10-minute lag. Yeah, or four seconds. 20, 20. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. 10 or 20 even at the the farthest. Yeah, Yeah, it depends on the position. 10 one way and 10 back, right? Exactly. So the, so the, 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 the question of how to create a sense of continuity between people who cannot have a real-time conversation, many of those ideas kind of began, spawned from from that event. One thing that I remember about that time, but I've never been able to verify again, and reading about the story of the Chilean miners, is that while they were trapped in the mine, and I hope this is true, and I wish I could find more details to verify, that they elected a poet, which is something that you would think was really rare when you're in such a a life-threatening situation. We were hearing clips of uh, one of the astronauts who is in your band, Katie Coleman, Chris Hadfield, and the music that he created on the International Space Station. There's beautiful clips of you trying to teach Jamie, your son, how to play the flute from the International Space Station, that you're playing tic-tac-toe. Talk about the, the importance of those things, art and music and poetry, when it comes to enduring uh, an event like a a separation unlike anything most people will ever experience. Astronaut Katie Coleman. Well, I I think being up there, I mean, you're so busy because you're, it's, it's a mission. I mean, you wake up and every five minutes is, is scheduled with things that are really important to do. And 
when I, I think it becomes really important that you have things to do and time to do them that are just yours because it means you get to be, you know, to do things that you think are important. And one of those for me was family. And so Jamie and I would, you know, read books. You know, Peter and the Star Catchers was this series that we were reading. And it had all these really cool aspects, and it made it so we didn't have to have those. I mean, I'd love to hear about it from Jamie's point of view, but I liked it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, not, you know, how are you? We didn't have to go, oh, how was your day? Oh, I don't know, Mom, how was your day? I mean, we just got, got to be together. So how was it for you, sweetie? Um, oh, I was awful. No, it's, um, <laughs> no, it, it, I think it, it really gave us a sense of normalcy because when I would come home from school, when Katie was not in space, we would practice flute together or we'd go over homework or something like that. And so to be able to do that on the space station in a relatively similar way, like at least once a week was, was really special. And, and I definitely think it helped us get through in the end. Well, and Jamie commuted between Houston and Hartford or, you know, Houston and Shelburne, just like we did. And one of the things we did when he was little was whoever he was with, we would take pictures of what he was doing so that when he ba went back to Houston from Massachusetts, he could show his friends, hey, this is where I live. And, you know, we have a cat and it looks like this and we have a pond and frogs. And, and, and so that idea, I think, of documenting, I mean, now he's studying photography and he's a freelance photographer. And I, and I think everyone has their own way of sort of capturing time in a way that means something to them. That segues very nicely into the thing that I was going to ask, which is, do you think that this experience of, of separation and reconnection really influences your work, Jamie Simpson? Um, absolutely. I, I like to define my work as being able to capture moments and that for the longest time I've I've been playing around with cameras and actually what, what Katie was talking about, taking pictures of what I was doing, that really started when Josh, my dad, had me writing a journal. So I'd be drawing pictures of what I was doing. And then that kind of evolved very naturally into taking photos with like whatever first camera I had. And so I, I think that wherever I'm at, I try to document what I'm doing and what I'm seeing so that I can show that to other people and they can experience it sort of vicariously through my camera. I think people, um, may know you best, Josh Simpson, for your Inhabited Worlds glass pieces. And that may seem like a response to having a wife who is in outer space, but it, that's actually not true, right? I was actually, um, I, I made planets actually for kids back in the early 70s when I moved to Massachusetts and uh, school groups would come to visit and I just started making marbles and marbles sort of morphed into planets at some point. And uh, and so by the time I met Katie, I'd already been making planets for a while. It turns well, out it's a good way to court astronauts. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Well, and, I, and I'm not actually the first one to bring any of them to space. But Oh, really? I, I thought you were. I uh, know. Nope. Wow, they'd already been in space That's before true. Katie Holmes? Well, because people loved them. But when yeah. I was in grad school here, the day I defended my, my thesis, I went to Silverscape Designs in, in Amherst, one of the, you know, beautiful Rest in gallery. peace, Silverscape. <laughs> and, I know, so beautiful. And yeah. to pick out my very own planet to start, like, the next phase of now I want to do, you know, I've got my degree and now I want to pursue But then she realized thing. if she got married to the glassblower, she'd get a better discount. <laughs> <laughs> We're speaking with the glassblower, Josh Simpson, the astronaut, Katie Coleman. Who likes discounts. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, everybody's collection needs a little bit of impetus. Yeah. <laughs> and if that means dating the or marrying the artist, then, Gotta you know, so it. be it. You know, in the minute or so we have left before uh, we have to let you go, tell us um, something important that you learned about how to deal with, that we can take away, that may not ever go to outer space, or that I can take away who said goodbye to my child going to college. Oh. An important way... To, to cope through these sad goodbyes, something that you've learned from this NASA psychologist that you chronicle in your new movie, The Longest Goodbye. Wow, what a question. I actually have not been asked that question. Would you believe it? <laughs> um, I um, I think if we, what I learned is that I, I stop kind of beating myself up over my own, that conflict or friction I've always always felt between my goals and my desires and my own personal dreams that could feel sort of, you know, selfish and, and, and create a big blind spot as to like how, how I maintain my, you know, my, my connectivity to my family and, and, and now my wife and my, and my, my two children that I, that I've had since start making this film <laughs> and, and I'm less, I'm a little bit more forgiving of that, back and forth that could be really troubling and complicated for people. I think the sort of the balance between like wanting to go as far as we want to go 
uh, as we can go and at the same time staying connected to our roots and that they, sometimes those things can't coexist at the same time, th that it's okay that you, that as long as those roots are real and strong, that you can come back to them. And also you have to acknowledge that you're going to be making new roots and new homes wherever it is you're going. Um, and that's okay too. So it's, it's, it's kind of just learning how kind of flexible we can be and that, that it's okay. That is the director, Ido Mizrahi, whose film, The Longest Goodbye, will screen at Amherst Cinema. It'll be in conversation with the stars of the film, astronaut Katie Coleman, glassblower Josh Simpson, and photographer and child of Josh and Katie, Jamie Simpson. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Since 1991, the Northampton Arts Council has put on a musical fundraiser called Transperformance, where local bands transform into more famous acts. But the name Transperformance sounds like it means something much different here in 2023. Tomorrow on The Fabulous 413, we'll talk with Steve Sanderson from the Northampton Arts Council and word nerd Emily Brewster from Merriam-Webster to brainstorm a better name for the Valley's premier end-of-summer musical event. This current one is not cutting it. Plus a preview of BrickCon Lego Convention coming to Springfield this weekend. Sounds like a blast. It will be. I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm Khalees Smith. See you tomorrow on the fabulous 413.